Well, good morning. It's hard to believe we're at our last chapel. I know some of you have been coming here for years and you've graduated from high school now and this is your last chapel. Let's pray again and just ask that God would move among us now. Oh Lord, we need You. We need Your love. We need Your strength. We need Your peace. We need Your presence with us. And so we ask that You would meet with us even now. That we would see Jesus in His glory. That we would see ourselves in His story. And would you make us a little more ready, a little more prepared to play the part that you have given each one of us to play as your people who belong to you by grace. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, please turn to the book of Ephesians today. We're going to look at two different texts there, not too far apart from each other. They're actually on facing pages for me in my Bible. Maybe they will be for you too. We'll find out. Be looking at Ephesians 2, the last half of Ephesians 2, and then the first six verses of Ephesians 4, and just kind of keep it going like we've been most of the week. Uh, We won't read those right away. First, just a reminder of where we've been and where this has all been going through the week in chapel, but it's really about where God's story is going, right? We've been talking about God's presence. Yes, He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times, but we've also been considering, we've mainly been considering, God's gracious presence. We've been tracing it through the story of the Bible and thinking about the difference that it should make in our lives. Why does it matter that God has saved us by His grace? Why does it matter that He has sent His Holy Spirit to live in us? What kind of difference should it make? We never have to be afraid of anything or anyone but Him. We will be completely purified one day when we see Jesus face to face. And so we pursue purity. We pursue holiness now. Wanting to be like our Heavenly Father. And it's the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Who enables us. Who empowers us to be able to do it. Because we can't do this on our own. You can't do anything for God without God. Because the Christian message is about so much more than you're a sinner, Jesus died for your sins, and if you trust Him when you die, you'll go to heaven. Now that's all true, but the story starts before that, and the story ends after that. If that is the sum of your understanding of the Gospel, then you're missing the beginning and the ending that ties the whole story together and makes sin mean anything, makes salvation mean anything, makes eternity mean anything anything. It's about God's presence. It's about being with Him. Reaching all the way back to Monday, which I know is ancient history. You've been busy memorizing so much other stuff than that. So just a reminder of the major points in the story, right? God, out of an overflow of love, created a world. And He put people in it. Not just to live and do their own thing and figure out their stuff but to fellowship with Him. To know Him and to be known and loved by Him. We were made for fellowship with God in the presence with God. We were also made for fellowship with one another. And we lost all of this in the fall. But God kept relentlessly coming after us. And there were signs of His presence all along the way. His presence was felt at Mount Sinai, right? It was felt as kind of a a terrible, an awful presence, a fearful presence. It was pictured in the tabernacle and in the temple. The picture of God dwelling in the middle of His people as they traveled. That holy of holies where only the high priest could go and even he could only go once a year to offer the sacrifice of atonement that would take care of the sins of the people so that they could be with God. God. 
And that's what the temple was at the center of Jerusalem's worship. That's where you would go to meet with God. And then Jesus came. And John tells us that Jesus tabernacled with us. That He was God's presence on the earth. So much so that when the Pharisees were giving Him a hard time about the temple, and what are you going to do? Are you greater than this building? And He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And of course, He wasn't talking about a physical building. He was talking about the temple of His body. That at the cross, the curtain was torn in two. Access to God's holy presence is now open to everyone who comes to God through the new curtain. That is, the flesh of Jesus. Trusting in His sacrifice on the tree. And in His powerful resurrection. And His presence is what we experience now, personally and in the church, because of the Holy Spirit. And it's what we will experience for all eternity as we considered on that first day reading from Revelation 21 and 22. What's the accent? What will make the new heavens and the new earth so great? It's not the streets of gold. We like to think about that. I loved that when I was a kid. You know, you get the pictures and I grew up on flannel graphs. Anybody flannel graph? Okay, great. You guys are my, you guys are my people. Good. We'd have those pictures and it's like, oh, it's gold. All right, the first thing that's wrong with it is what does the Bible say about that? It's transparent as glass, so it doesn't look like the gold that we think of. So that's the first thing that's wrong. The point isn't so much like, oh, it's going to be gold, it's going to be awesome. It's that God is so awesome, gold will be what's used for the streets. Do you get that? Like, we don't think much about what we walk on except for when there's potholes. Right? What is that? I don't know. That's what the streets will be made of because gold will be that unimportant. And where God lives will be so beautiful and so bright because He is there. We will experience... Not just no more sickness, which many of us after this week will be very thankful for. No more sadness, no more sorrow, but no more sin separating us from God. Not a bit, not a chance. That is our hope, and it is secure. It's as sure as you're sitting here because of Christ. The Christian message is so much bigger than we tend to think, and especially if we put ourselves at the center. The Christian message is so much bigger than that message, right? It's about God. It's about His glory. It's about what He has done and is doing to redeem a people for Himself. And it's so much bigger than a me and Jesus experience. We want to think together today about God's unifying presence. Yes, He unites us to Himself, but He unites us to one another. It's so much bigger than a me and Jesus experience. One way to think about this is how many of you enjoy, uh, I know we're at a music camp and I'm going out on a limb. How many of you enjoy sports? Okay, good. I feel better. And it's okay if you didn't raise your hand. It's one thing to watch a game on TV, and some sports like football are actually better on TV because you can actually see what's happening on the replays. But, let's say it's hockey. Any hockey fans here? Okay, a few. Maybe that's the wrong one. Um, Going to a game is so much better than watching on TV because you're there with... 40,000 people maybe at the bank, 65,000 people at the link, 18,000 people at Wells Fargo, most of whom want the exact same thing that you want and are really excited to be here. And so when they score, you celebrate, you scream, 
and you yell, and you wonder why the person in regular clothes with no team identification next to you isn't. That's because they're afraid to wear their team colors at our stadiums, okay? <laughs> There's good and bad reasons for that. It's, it's not something to be particularly proud of. We ran into some people like that several years ago at a game. They were fans of the opposing team, and they were there for the entire three-game series, and they were dressed like, like this. It's like, dude, you're at a baseball game. It's like, yeah, well, we heard it's bad. It's like, oh, <laughs> It's okay, it's baseball. They won't kill you for baseball unless you're the Mets. <laughs> and it wasn't the Mets, so that was an easy one. They're fine. But it's one thing to watch a game on TV. It's another one to be there. And when they score or when they win, you find yourself high-fiving people you have never seen before and will never see again. Sometimes you find yourself hugging people you've never seen before and you'll never see again. And you're screaming and yelling and jumping up and down like your best friends. Why? Because you love the Eagles or the Flyers or whomever. There you go. I, yes. All right. You are in, in that moment, you're in the same story. And there's something about being there together that makes it better. Or think about last night some of the pieces that we heard. There are recordings of those pieces, I assume. I haven't listened to any. You could find them on Spotify or whatever your music source of choice is. And you could listen to them and you could go, oh, that's beautiful. But wasn't it something else to be right here? You feel it differently when you're there. And it was even different. It's not just that like, okay, it was live and that was great. That probably would have been enough for me, like to be the only one in here with the musicians. But wasn't it even better because we were all here? And we felt that together and you felt like, wait, what is happening right now during a couple of those? In a good way, right? We were like, what is going on? I can't believe I'm here for this. This is so cool. And it was orders of magnitude more magical because we were all here. Christianity is so much bigger than you and Jesus, and there's a way in which that would be enough. If he saved you and you had his presence alone forever, that would be enough. But he's designed it to be even better than that. At the end in that new Jerusalem, it's not just you and Jesus, and you get to see him, and that's cool, and you get to do whatever your favorite things were on the earth. It's that we will be with God and all his people, worshiping him, giving him the glory that he is due. Because we all have the same story. We were lost. And we've been found by the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be with Him forever. That is our story. We were lost, we were found, and we didn't find ourselves. It's not that we decided one day, we woke up, it's like, you know what, I'm going to be good today. I'm going to go after God today. No, He came for us. And we are part of His story. So we're all part of the same story. We all have the same Savior. And we all have the same Holy Spirit. So if we're united to God, then we are united to one another. No matter what our other differences are. Kind of like when we're at an Eagles game, right? If you're wearing green, if you're celebrating when the right team scores, you're my friend. I don't know where you're from. I don't know what you believe. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, though the way prices are going, everybody's rich, I feel like, or got in for free somehow with a friend. Right? But it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what you look like. We're all there together. And we have that feeling. We are on the same team. But for us, yes, we have the story, but we also have the spirit who testifies in us that we are his. If we are united, to God, if we are united to Christ by faith, we are united to one another. So now look at Ephesians 2. 
He's been writing about how we were dead in sins. This is our story. We were dead in our trespasses and sins in the first half of Ephesians 2. But God, because of His great love with which He loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace you've been saved. Probably the first verses you ever memorized from Ephesians 2 were verses 8 and 9. Right? For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works. So that no one may boast. Verse 10, For we're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works was God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then He addresses something that's going on in the church. Because in the early church, there was a significant division that they weren't sure how to cross the divide between those who were Jews, those who had known God under the Old Covenant, and those who were Gentiles, those who were on the outside. And you'll see a lot of outside language in these first few verses. So let's read from verse 11. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you were no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We were separated, and we would have remained naturally separated from God and from one another. But in Christ, we are brought together. We're made into one new body through Christ Jesus. We have access to God through Christ by the Spirit. And so we have peace with God and with one another. Think about it as a triangle, right? We're God's one point. We're at a point over here. You're at a point over there, right? We're far off from each other and we're far off from Him. But as we are drawn to Him, what's happening with us? We're getting closer together, right? If we're going to that same point, we are drawn together. He uses lots of pictures for what we are, that we are no longer outsiders, but we are insiders. We're no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens. We're part of a building that's built on this foundation. And what is the building? The temple. What's the temple? It's where God lives. It says you, we, the church, are being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And you might be used to the idea, and we've even talked about it this week, that your body is the temple of God. And that is true individually because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And wherever the Holy Spirit lives, God lives. And if He lives in you, then you are a temple. But most of those yous in First and Second Corinthians talking about you are the temple of God, they don't come over well in English because most people aren't from Philly and you can't just say yous. Where you know, like, that's a plural. Or if you're from the South and you can say y'all, there'd be lots of y'alls in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, where we read you. It's one advantage of the King James, actually. Wherever you see ye, that's plural. That's bonus. Not in the notes. 
There are lots of plural yous. It's that you guys, yous guys, y'all, wherever you're from, however you say it, you plural are the temple of God. You are being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Not only individually, but corporately. He goes on to dis- dis- a- apply this unity in chapter 4. So if you need to flip a page, you can flip a page. If you've got it like me on a facing page, you can stay right there. Ephesians 4.1 I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Did you hear the word one a lot in there? Did you see it? So when we think about the church's one foundation, right, is Jesus Christ our Lord. But He's chosen a people from every nation to be one. We partake the same holy food. We press toward the same hope. And we have the same Spirit who gets us there. He says to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He describes that unity as something that already exists. Did you catch that? It's not create unity. There's disunity, you create it. The unity is created by Jesus. It's created by the Holy Spirit living in us. And we are called to maintain it. To live like who we are. In the Holy Spirit, as one body. Now in this life, we will never see that perfected because of the sin that remains with us. But we move toward the unity we already have in Christ by the Spirit. And that we will experience in perfection in the new heavens and the new earth. We move toward who we will be because of who we are already. Just like we do that with Holiness with purity, we do that with unity. We move toward what we will experience in this life. Because we are, even now, God's dwelling place. And we will be God's dwelling place. But it's not only future. We get foretastes of it now as we gather with God's people to worship Him. There's a special way that God is with us when Christians get together. You feel it this week. I feel it and some of you have felt it when you go to other countries. Sometimes where you don't even speak the same language as the people. But God's Spirit in you testifies with their spirit that we belong to Christ and we are one with God and with one another. You don't even need the same language or culture to know it. It's true when just a few are gathered in Jesus' name. And it's especially true when the church gathers. So we want to pursue unity and love and humility and patience. And we want to come to church this Sunday expectant. The church is God's dwelling place, not the building. The building is not where God lives and He's there all week and we come back to see Him. It's as all these individual temples of God come together and gather as the church, that we as the church are God's dwelling place. So I'd encourage you. Now this weekend, maybe you'll be sick and tired and coughing and sneezing. Maybe you won't even be home in time for that, depending on how far you live away from here. So maybe it'll be the next Sunday. But when you gather with the church, what do you think is happening? Is it there for, well, we got things to do for God. He likes us to do these things. And so we're going to give to him what he deserves. Again, that is not untrue, right? Just as many of the rules. It's not that the rules disappear. They just have a completely different meaning 
when we understand what they're for and how they're connected to the gospel and what he is making us and what he is doing in us. I'd encourage you, prepare in advance for Sunday. This is hard, especially for teenagers. Get the sleep that you need before Sunday morning. Act like Sunday morning is something really important to you, and you'll find that it becomes more valuable to you. But if you prepare ahead of time and make sure you get rest, just like you would for a big performance, right? It's like, oh, I can't eat that right before I play. That'll be a problem, right? I can't drink that right before I sing. That will be a problem. I can't do that, right? Is it because milk is the worst and no one should ever drink it? Now, I think that personally, but you probably don't feel that way, right? But the singers know, right? Did you, did you have a big glass of milk last night before you sang? No. And you would never do that, right? Because it's a rule. It's a rule. i got to keep the rules. Why is it a rule? Because it's good for you. Right? It's good for you. You don't think of that as like, man, I have this long list of things I have to follow if I want to be a good musician. That's so annoying. Right? You give those up to be able to have the experience. So prepare. But even more than that, you're not just coming to give something to God. You are coming to receive from God. That's planned. The texts that are sung. The sermon text, the reading text, if you have an Old Testament and New Testament reading, the prayers that are prayed, hopefully where you gather with other believers, all of that has been carefully planned to tell the story of God's redemption. And maybe you've never noticed it before and your church does a really good job and it's just not too obvious. And so pay attention even as you go home. It's like, what is the flow of our liturgy? Where is it going? What are we doing? What story are we telling? I would bet that many of them are telling the story of the gospel from God's glory to our sin and need of his grace to assurance of pardon, forgiveness that we have through Christ and celebration of that good news and then wanting to give all that we have back to him because he is so worthy of it. But all the planning in the world doesn't make it effective. It's the Holy Spirit who comes and meets with us. And so do you expect God to meet with you on Sunday? To correct you? To care for you? To meet you right where you are and give you exactly the word that you need? And melt your heart again so that you know God's love for you in Christ? Do you look for Him to instruct you? To guide you in the way that you should go? To change you? To make you more like Christ? To love what He loves? To want what He wants? And with His power to be able to do what He's given you to do. We can come to God with that kind of expectation because we have that kind of God. And we don't do it alone. Singing together, just like experiencing last night, was much better together than if you'd been listening to it on the radio or in your car or something. It's the same thing. You know, I can listen to worship music in my car by myself. Why do I need to go to church? Many people have said that. Well, what's different? God's people are gathered. God's presence is especially palpable there. We feel that difference as we sing together. But it's not just that, hey, there's a bunch of other people who believe, though that can be incredibly helpful. There's other people who appreciate this too, who believe this too. Even that can be a good reminder for us. But it's not only that, we fellowship with God and with one another. So one other way I'd ask you to prepare is you're thinking about, okay, I want to be more aware. Hopefully, coming out of this week, I want to be more aware of the presence of God in my life. God is present in you, and God is present in others who are in Christ, who are gathering with you in the church. And God maybe intends to use you to build someone up on Sunday. And maybe God intends others in your church to build you up. Not just the people up front, Right? I think that what's up front is really important, but it's not all. We don't come just to give to God, we come to receive from Him. We don't come just to relate to God like no one else is there, closing our eyes and pretending we're all alone while we're listening to the off-key person next to us. 
It's that God has brought us together to sing to Him, to hear from Him, to love Him, to worship Him, and to encourage and exhort and build up one another. And I love to look around at our own church and see people with a hand on a shoulder and a hand in the air praying, asking for God to help, to give grace, whatever the situation that is needed. You might say, I'm just a kid. Don't be out front trying to be seen by everybody, but maybe put some new glasses on. What am I doing here today? Why has God brought me to this place with these people today? And what difference should it make that I have gathered with them? And ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, to help you. To know even whom to ask if they would like prayer. Whom you can encourage. And maybe come in asking God. God, send someone to me. I need that encouragement today. It's not just me and Jesus. It's all of us. With all the grace that God gives us. We are His now and forever. God has made us to be one with Him and one with each other. And so let's be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, realizing and remembering that we are being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. Not just for today, but because it's for eternity. It is by His grace. It is for His glory. And it is for our everlasting joy. Let's pray. Oh God, this is too much for us. But we thank You that by Your grace, we are part of this story. Would You help us to think about how we can play the part that You have given us to play in Your story? Pursuing holiness, pursuing unity, resting in your peace, never being afraid of anyone or anything because you are with us and we will be with you and all your people forever. Would you help us by your Holy Spirit, by your grace, for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.